Welcome to another NAC at Home program. Uh, my name is David Zyla, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So today's guest, um, I'm very excited to introduce to you. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Carey Mahone. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is the author of the book, Scandalous Women, which was released in 2011 to very enthusiastic reviews. Since the book's release, it has been sold to Thailand, Korea, and Poland. Scandalous Women was an RT book review nonfiction pick for April 2011. And Elizabeth was also named RWA NYC's Author of the Year. She has spoken at the We Move Forward Conference in Mexico, the Historical Novel Society North America Conference, and participated in Chick History's year-long project, Hashtag Her Story. She has been interviewed by Marie Claire Malaysia, NPR, Extraordinary Women TV, The West Side Spirit, Vogue, Times of London, NBC Online, and the Pittsburgh Historical Fiction Examiner. Elizabeth has been featured in the H2 show, How Sex Changed the World, as well as the Travel Channel's Monumental Mysteries and the Investigation Discovery show, Tabloid. A pop culture diva, Elizabeth has written for The Royal Representative, Heroes and Heartbreakers, Ever After Romance, and Criminal Element. Her next book, Pretty Evil New York, True Stories of Mobster Moles, Violent Vixens, and Murderous Matriarchs by Globe Pico Press will be out in August of 2021. Uh, before I officially bring Elizabeth out, I also just want to mention to you that if you have any questions for Elizabeth, you can type them into the chat box. Also, we'll be providing a link there on how you can purchase her book, Scandalous Women. So, without further ado, welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, David. I'm so happy to be here and to be doing this presentation on Cosmetics Queens. Thank you for having me. Well, we are absolutely thrilled to have you. And, and today's subject, uh, Cosmetics Queens, is just one section of your wonderful book, Scandalous Women. And I'm wondering if you would tell our audience uh, a little bit about Scandalous Women, how that book came about. What really inspired you to put this collection of stories together? Well, it actually started out as just a blog. Um, I had been writing um, for years, just you know, blogging about my life as a you know New Yorker, um, and I was bored. And I have always been a history buff, just since childhood. And I started thinking about all these amazing women that I had read about that a lot of people didn't know about. So I just started blogging and it slowly started to pick up and I had a, a, a following of people who you know were eager to read these stories and um, it was after I got laid off <laughs> in the great you know 2008 recession um, that I sat down and really got serious about um, the idea of putting them together as as a book and I was lucky enough that I knew an agent um, that I had met through various writers conferences and uh, she loved the idea. We put together a book proposal and um, nine months later we sold the book. Excellent. And then two years later it came out. So we're very fortunate that you were laid off. Yes. <laughs> or we wouldn't have this fabulous book. <laughs> I'd probably still, you know, be blogging or doing something else, but this really made me sit down and go, okay, let's, let's do this and really yeah. focus. 
Wonderful. So, so in putting the book Scandalous Women together, what would you say was the most surprising uh, thing that you learned along the way? Oh, goodness. Or um, unexpected, I should say. I think the fact that Josephine Baker had been worked for the resistance in France during World War II, that she was essentially, she was a spy. Um, that blew my mind because, you know, you think of Josephine Baker and the banana skirt and the, the cheetah and, you know, the glamorous gowns. But no, she, you know, volunteered to be um, a special correspondent um, to, because she loved France. France had given, France had made her what she was, she felt. And she wanted to give back to this country that had given her so much. So she was a spy in Portugal and Morocco during World War II. And that was surprising to me. I knew nothing about that. She's wow, I didn't either. And that's, wow, just one of the many women that you profile. So, um, so specifically today, uh, we're gonna learn about the women who really created the um, cosmetics industry. And um, I wonder if you would tell us all sure. about incredible women. I would love to, would love to. So, um, as we know, cosmetics have been around for forever. Um, but it wasn't until the 19th century with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and manufacturing that it actually um, began to be seen as a business and something that women could do. This was a way that they could enter the business world was through this medium of cosmetics. And when I talk about cosmetics, I don't just mean makeup. I'm talking uh, hair, skin, um, which is really how the beauty industry started was um, actually with uh, face creams. Um, women had been creating face creams on their own or they had someone in their village who created face creams, but the first woman who actually really took face creams and took it out into the business world was our first woman, which is a woman named Harriet Hubbard Ayers. Now, Harriet was the first woman to own a, a cosmetics company in the United States, which set the stage for all the women who we're gonna talk about today. Uh, at the end of her life, she was the highest paid newspaper woman in the United States. And she paved the way for selling cosmetics in a spectacular setting and reassuring women that spending money on cosmetics weren't going to harm their reputation. Because, you know, um, in the 19th century, women wearing cosmetics, you were either an actress or you were prostituted <laughs> if you wore cosmetics. But Harriet, Harriet actually sort of changed all that. So Harriet was born from a very prominent family in Chicago. She, um, her grandfather read law with Aaron Burr. So, you know, her, her life should have been that of uh, just, you know, a socialite who you know, did charity work and um, went to parties, but everything changed when her husband lost his business. He went bankrupt and Harriet was left with finding some way of supporting her two children. You know, she had a small inheritance from her mother, but it wasn't enough to support her and her children in the South, which they were used to living. So Harriet did something that was unusual for the time. She moved to New York with her kids she got a job at a high-end furniture store um, where she, they hired her because of her name and her contacts, and she sold furniture for them for a number of years, but then she went out on her own as an interior decorator, and it was while she was on a business trip to Paris that she learned about this face cream that had been created for uh, Madame Racamier who was a French socialite of the 19, early, late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, she had a salon. She was very well known at the time. If we can just flip to the next slide. Okay. 
Yes. So this is Madame Recamier. I'm sure we've all seen this portrait of her. And that's her uh, as she was on the front of uh, one of Harriet's um, creams. So Harriet, this chemist, told her about this cream. So Harriet bought the recipe, the formula for it, and she took it back to the States. And in 1883, she started the Rick Camier Manufacturing Company and started selling these, these creams. And from the beginning, it was a huge success. You can see some of the products that she created, Luxuria, um, the moth and freckle lotion and one of her um, ads. And what Harriet did, which was different, is she actually put her name and her address in all the ads. And this was at a time in the 19th century where socialized, you only had your name in the paper three times, when you were born, when you got married, and when you died. And here's Harriet not only putting her name on her product, but her address and also her family crest. <laughs> which was hugely, you know, unusual at the time. And not only did she start her own company, but, you know, this was, you know, department stores didn't sell cosmetics. There was no, you know, huge outlay of cosmetics. So she sold it through mail order. And she also actually, she had her own shop down on Lower Fifth Avenue, which is where Tiffany's was and all the, you know, the Lord and Taylor's. So women could come into her shop and try the creams on, and that was one of the ways that she sold her product. She also had um, famous actresses of the time, like Lillian Russell and Sarah Bernhardt, uh, advertising, you know, doing advertisements saying, you know, they use the cream. And she also had chemists who uh, said in ads that there was no, there was nothing harmful in the lotions, which was a huge thing because a lot of cosmetics at that time, facial lotions, had lead in it. They had zinc. So she was saying, look, you can use my creams and, you know, nothing bad will happen to you. You'll just be, you know, your face will just be lovely. There we go. Uh -huh. So this is, uh, again, this is her book that she came up with later. So Harriet was a huge success and she even had her products sold in London when Buffalo Bill took his Wild West show. She had her products sold there. Um, but unfortunately for Harriet, she had a business partner named James Seymour who was unscrupulous and who wanted most of the profits for himself. So uh, he tried suing her to gain control of her company. That didn't work. So what he ended up doing is he ended up paying her ex-husband and her daughter, who was conveniently married to Seymour's son, to have her declared insane. And Harriet, you know, she had no idea this was happening. She got into a carriage one day, thought she was going off to see her daughter and her grandchildren in New Jersey. And they took her to an asylum in Bronxville, where she was declared insane, so that they could get control of her company. It took her a year to get out of the asylum through the help of someone who was visiting uh, a relative. She convinced him that she didn't need to be there, and she managed to get out of the asylum. But by the time she got out in uh, 1894, um, her company was done. It went into receivership. So Harriet had to reinvent herself yet again. She started uh, lecturing about her time in the asylum, which got her a job uh, working for the New York World, where she uh, dispensed beauty tips. She became the editor of the Women's Page at the New York World. And in 1899, a collection of her columns was published in this book, Harriet Hubbard Ayer's book of health and beauty, which uh, was actually still in print in the 1950s. Um, she died in 1904, very young for the time. She was only 54. Um, her company has since been revived by various people. Um, her younger daughter, Margaret, for a time uh, ran the company, but she is our first mogul 
Let's see if I can find the, oh, there we go. So our next woman is Annie Turnbow Malone. So if anyone watched uh, Self Made on Netflix, you probably saw a woman named Addie Monroe, who is sort of a, part of her story in the series is based on this woman, Annie Turnbow Malone. Uh, Annie was one of the first African-American women to become a millionaire. Uh, there's sort of a, an argument on who got there first, Annie or Madam C.J. Walker. I don't think it really matters. They were both millionaires, but there's some people like want to argue on who got there first. She founded and developed one of the first commercial enterprises centered on cosmetics for African-American women. She founded Poro College, which was the first educational institution in the U.S dedicated to study and teaching of black cosmetology. And she trained over 75,000 women entrepreneurs, including Madam C.J. Walker. That's Annie. So Annie was born uh, just after the Civil War. Her parents had been enslaved and uh, she was the youngest of 11 children. She actually had somewhat of a high school education um, but she had to leave school early because of ill health. But she was always interested in hair and playing with hair. And she noticed that a lot of the African-American women that she knew, including her own, were suffering from hair loss. And she worked with experiments and with her aunt that she lived with, who was an herbalist, to develop what she called Wondrous Hair Grower to cleanse the scalp and help women to grow their hair because um, women, black women at the time, there weren't that many hair care products on the market for them. So women were using household products like goose fat, bacon grease, and butter to straighten their hair and to keep it neat. And because you know, poor women didn't have access to uh, running water, they were only like washing their hair maybe once a month. So imagine all this gunk that they had in their hair. So Annie came up with the Wondrous Hair Grower to cleanse the scalp because she realized a clean, healthy scalp would lead to hair growth. So she uh, started selling her products door to door, just you know, going, knocking on the door. Uh, she would demonstrate the product to women. And from the beginning, it was such a huge success that she soon was able to hire three women to help her, which is, you know, amazing. And um, she moved to St. Louis. Let's go back. She moved to St. Louis, which was uh, a huge, had a huge African-American population. And it also had the 1904 World's Fair, and which was a great place for Annie to set up and to sell her products. And she was meeting women at, from all over the diaspora, from the Caribbean, from Africa, and selling her products. And she uh, started selling her products through you know, multi-level marketing, which is what Avon does, and uh, most companies do, which is she would train sales agents to sell the product. They would then go out and then train other sales agents, and so on and so forth. And they would each get sort of um, you know, a little bit of the person before them. So that sort of level. And before you knew it, she was selling, she had 5,000 people who were working for her that she had trained. She would go out to black churches, women's clubs, uh, she would give speeches, you know, selling her product. And in fact, one of the women that she trained, who we'll get to later, was Madam C.J. Walker. Um, by the time that she 1906, she finally incorporated her company and um, she named it Poro, which was a West African word, which meant uh, spirituality. And it was also the first initials of her last name. She was married to a man named Pope at the time and her sister's married last name, so Poro. So by 1918, she was able to buy this building in St. Louis, which was an entire city block. It cost half a million dollars 
in 1918 money to build this. And it was not only a college where she trained all the uh, sales agents and beauticians to go out and sell the product, but it was also the manufacturing for the, the product. It was the offices. It had a theater. It was really more of an office building and also community center. Um, you know, African Americans in the neighborhood could rent conference rooms. There was a bakery, an ice cream parlor. There was a hospital. In fact, um, there was a tornado in St. Louis in I think 1924, and uh, she offered her building to be able to house people who were left destitute by the tornado. Um, so by this time, by the time she was 33, she was a millionaire, and by 1924, her company was worth $14 million, which is amazing for the time. Um, she would offer incentives to her employees. If they worked for five years, they would get a diamond ring. Um, she would offer them low-cost mortgages. She encouraged them to buy houses and also to give back to the community. Uh, she was a huge philanthropist. She gave $10,000 to the uh, St. Louis Colored Orphans Home because she had been an orphan. And it's actually now named the Annie Malone Children's Home. And every year in St. Louis, they, they throw a parade in her honor, uh, which they've been doing since 1910. And it's the second oldest African-American parade in the United States. So Annie was, um, she was a great philanthropist. She at one point uh, was supporting two students to go to every historically black college in the United States. Um, but she was not good at choosing people to uh, run the company while she was off uh, giving speeches and drumming up business. And also she was not good, very good at picking husbands. <laughs> and that's where her company ended up faltering her second husband, Aaron Malone, um, when they filed for divorce, he claimed that he was responsible, halfway responsible for her success. Um, they went to court for six years. He wanted half the business. She finally ended up paying him $200,000 to get rid of him. Um, but by that time, other things were happening. Uh, she, the people that she hired Either they were incompetent or they were unscrupulous. Um, she moved finally her business to Chicago, but it wasn't the same after that. Um, she ended up owing thousands of dollars to the IRS. Her company went into receivership. She ended up uh, losing this building and also the Chicago building. That's Chuck Berry. That's one of the. Uh, oh, that's Chuck Berry. That's one of the people who trained at Coral College. So he's the most famous person. So by the time she died in 1957, um, there really wasn't anything left of her company. She still was able to leave her nieces and nephews $100,000, but um, she's sort of a, a cautionary tale of what can happen if you're not business savvy, which leads us to our next woman, Madam C.J. Walker. I love this quote. I got my start by giving myself a start. And she established the first hairdressers union for black women and marketed what they call the Walker system for straightening hair. Um, like, like Annie Malone, her parents were enslaved. Um, she was also orphaned at an early age. By 14, she was married. She had her first and only child at 18, and by 20, she was widowed. Um, the only, she had to drop out of school at an early age, so the only jobs that she could get were uh, as a laundress or uh, as a cook. And like uh, other black women, her hair started to fall out from the stress. Uh, she met Annie Malone when they were both living in St. Louis, and she tried Annie's products to grow her hair uh, it's success. So she started selling Poro products. And when she moved to Denver, she was still selling them, but somewhere along the line, either they had a falling out, nobody knows 
quite, quite sure what happened, but soon uh, she was selling her own products. Um, she had this great marketing strategy. She claimed that uh, she got the formula, it came to her in a dream. Uh, an African man came to her and told her the ingredients, some of which she had to have sent from Africa, and that she uh, made the, the formula in her kitchen. Probably what she did is she took Annie's Wondrous Hair Grower to a chemist and found out what the formula was and then added her own um, touches to it. But what she did do, which was different, is she put her face and her name on the product. She was her brand, which was very different from what Annie was doing. Um, and that's really what made the, the difference was her using her story to sell the product. And also calling herself Madden C.J. Walker, you know, at the time women were uh, called Auntie, um, you know, Aunt Jemima. Um, so putting Madam C.J. Walker was a way, of, a moment of pride um, that she was claiming this product. And um, within four years of starting her company, and she was also smarter than Annie because she incorporated from the beginning and took a patent on her wondrous hair grower. So she was a much smarter businesswoman. She was able to attract um, talent to run her company. She met a lawyer, uh, F.B. Ransom, who became the president of her company, who really took care of the company while Madam C.J. Walker went out uh, beating the drum. And what really made her company take off was in 1912, she went to, um, she went to the National Negro, Negro Business League meeting, um, which was run by Booker T. Washington, who was probably one of the most famous black men of the early 20th century. And um, he refused to recognize or to let her speak but she wasn't going to let him do that. She actually stood up and said, surely you're not going to shut the door in my face. And she got up and gave an impassioned speech telling her story. And he was so impressed with her that he invited her back the next year to speak. And that was one of the things that took her company to the next level. She was also amazing at marketing. She, her husband, uh, Charles Walker had been in advertising selling for black newspapers. So she took out huge ads in all the black newspapers, you know, tooting her story. Um, she wasn't meek. She wasn't afraid to be aggressive. And um, by 1910, which is four years after she started her company, she had 5,000 people working for her. And she was making $7,000 a week, which is, I don't even know what that is in today's money. Um, she moved to Indianapolis, where she um, became the company headquarters. And um, she built a building that's still there to get today, which is the Madam C.J. Walker Theater Center. She eventually moved her company to New York, where she built and these are some of the women in the Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Culture School. This is the Walker Theater, which still exists. And right here is the house that she built in 1918, the year before she died. She hired the uh, first black architect in New York, whose name was Uh, Berner Woodson Tandy to build her a 20,000 square foot but 34 room mansion in Irvington on Hudson uh, amongst the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the Goulds. And she actually had her house built on the main road instead of uh, on the water because she wanted everyone who drove past to see her house and see what she built. So she died in 1919 um, of hypertension. But her company, unlike Annie's, survived. It made its way through the Depression. Her daughter, Amelia, ran it. Uh, 
her daughter after that. The company uh, lasted until 1981. Uh, it was eventually bought by Unilever, who now produces uh, new Madam C.J. Walker products, which you can buy at Sephora. Um, but she's a, an example of hard work, determination, marketing, know-how. I mean, she's really like one of the women that it, it's just so, her story is just so inspirational. And now we get to our next great woman, Helena Rubinstein. Um, I love this quote, there are no ugly women, only lazy ones, <laughs> which is, it's kind of cruel, um, but that's what she felt. She felt that every woman should look their best and that there was no reason for any woman to feel unattractive or ugly. They just needed to put the effort in. Um, she manufactured the first waterproof mascara ever on the market. And later on, she pioneered, and this is something that I found amazing. Um, in the 1950s, she pioneered the first ever liquid mascara. I mean, before her, women used, to, it was cake mascara and you have to like water or spit in it to get the brush and do mascara. She created the liquid that we now use with the wand every day. And she was one of the first women to deduce that, you know, there are three types of skin, oily, dry, and normal. This is some, I love, these are some of the images of her, her products over the years. So Helena Rubinstein was born in Poland. Um, she was the oldest daughter of seven daughters. And um, she, her father was a kerosene salesman and she, got to a certain age, she was in her 20s, and her parents were like, you need to get married because otherwise your sisters can't get married. And she didn't want, she wasn't interested. She wanted to live an independent life. So her parents, her father basically said, well, you can't live here anymore. So she left Poland, went to first to Vienna and then to Australia by herself, which was a huge thing. Women traveling, you just didn't travel alone and certainly that far. And when she got to Australia, she brought these face creams that she got from her mother. And she noticed that women in Australia had terrible skin because of the sun and they didn't take care of it. And they noticed her skin and how amazing it was. So she thought, huh, I can sell these creams that my mother gave me to these women and make some money. And she did, and she, at first initially she was having her mother send them. And finally she took it to a chemist who improved the formula, realizing that they could use lanolin, which is something that comes from sheep. And what does Australia have a lot of? They have a lot of sheep. So that was her first product. She called it Belaze, which was a nice fancy name. And by 1900, she had her first salon uh, two years after that, she had salons in Sydney, Wellington, Melbourne. She was able to go back to Europe to learn about uh, techniques that Europeans, you know, uh, face cleansers, uh, electroshock, and she learned all this and she took it back and used them in her salons. And by 1908, she was able to open a salon in London. By 1912, she was in Paris. And by the time of the First World War, uh, she decided it was time for her to conquer America. So she moved to New York, where she met her great rival, um, well, didn't meet her. She opened a salon in Fifth Avenue, which was a few doors down from Elizabeth Arden, who uh, for the next 50 years, these women were great rivals and, um, What's interesting about these two women is, is these were two women who probably, if they'd actually sat down and talked and gotten to know each other, they, they might not have been friends, but they would have realized how much they had in common. I mean, they were both immigrants. Helena Rubinstein from Poland, Elizabeth Arden came from Toronto. They were both driven. They both knew instinctively what women wanted. They were both workaholics. Uh, they both uh, eventually married minor European royalty. 
and they also poached each other's you know staff constantly um in fact at one point helena rubenstein hired elizabeth arden's ex-husband because she wanted to find out <laughs> elizabeth arden's secret she, she thought i'll just hire her ex-husband and he'll tell me everything that i need to know about her um but they were you know just huge rivals and you know when one would move up fifth avenue the other one would follow and um they just really just both were um two women who managed to at this point you know cosmetics are starting to not be seen they're still kind of racy but they did a lot to um make it okay for the average woman to wear lipstick and mascara. The woman on the left, that is Theta Barra, um, she asked Helena Rubenstein to design makeup for her that would emphasize her eyes. So that's, she created the, the smoky eye that became Theta Barra's uh, signature. And Helena Rubenstein actually created uh, a makeup line called The Vamp, which was based on Theta Barra. And on the right is uh, one of her early uh, face powders called Water Lily. So Helena Rudenstein was um, a savvy marketer. She was helped by her first husband, Edward Titus, who was also um, in advertising. And um, she did things like uh, when she created, when she produced the first mascara, that's the what we think of as mascara today on the left. Um, but she launched her waterproof mascara at the 1939 World's Fair, and she did it with a synchronized swimming team to show that the mascara was waterproof. Uh, when she launched her perfume Heaven Scent, she sent balloons down on Fifth Avenue with little samples of Heaven Scent uh, for people to take home. Um, and she was just an amazingly savvy businesswoman. She sold her uh, US business to Lehman Brothers just before the crash for uh, $7 million. And uh, Lehman Brothers did not know what to do with uh, her company. They actually almost ran it into the ground. So she ended up buying back the stock after the crash for like, a dollar per share and she made millions on the deal. Um, she was really interested in what the women who bought her products uh, thought. She you know, talked to everyone. It didn't matter if they were a shop girl or secretary. She wanted to know what they thought to see how that she could make her products better. Uh, the product on the far right is another way she and Elizabeth Arden competed because during World War II, uh, you know, you couldn't get silk stockings because the material was being used for parachutes. So first Elizabeth Arden came up with sort of like a self tanner that made it look like you wore stockings. And then, uh, of course, Helena Rubenstein had to come up with her own <laughs> version of it. So that's another way in which they competed. Um, by the time Helena Rubenstein died in 1965, um, she built up a huge beauty empire. There were 629 beauty items, 62 creams, 78 powders, 46 perfumes, 69 lotions. Um, she operated salons all over the world and launched scores of products that are sold globally. Um, even in her 90s, she was feisty. She managed to foil a robbery in her apartment. Um, three intruders broke in as flower delivery man, men, and she told them, look, I'm old, you can kill me, but you're not gonna get any of my money. <laughs> So they ended up only getting $100 from her wallet. <laughs> so um, the company still exists. It was uh, eventually sold to L'Oreal in 1988. 
and it remains anchored in its founders' values, science and the survey of, service of beauty, women's liberation, and the audacity to rewrite the rules. So now we have our, our next woman, Elizabeth Arden, who said, I don't sell beauty, I sell hope. She was the first to make a cosmetics commercial which was shown in movie houses. She's one of the first to market eye makeup to respectable women along with a uh, matching look lip and nail lacquers. She's one of the first to open a spa resort, um, you know, what we think of like Canyon Ranch. She was one of the first to open one of those in Maine. And in 1947, and I think this is probably one of the things that she was most proud of, her horse jet pilot won the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> So Elizabeth Arden was actually born Florence Nightingale Graham in Toronto. Uh, her family was very poor growing up and uh, she wanted to be one of those women that she saw in Toronto, the rich, wealthy society women. That was her goal. Um, she had many jobs. She tried to become a nurse, but she, like her namesake, Florence Nightingale, but she couldn't stand the sight of blood. So she eventually followed her brother to New York where she got a job in a salon, which is where she learned how to uh, mis do facial massage. And she was very good at it. Um, she seemed to have a, a, a knack for facial massage. And she learned the trade of working from the various salons and she went into a business with a woman named Elizabeth Hubbard, and they opened their first salon. And um, the women didn't get along, so uh, Elizabeth Arden took the biz bought out the other woman, and she decided she liked the name Elizabeth. It was great. It was aristocratic, elegant, um, but she wanted something other than Hubbard. And she'd been reading an Alfred Lord Tennyson poem, and she saw the word Arden. And that's how she took the name Elizabeth Arden. Another uh, story is that um, Arden only had five letters, and it started with an A. And it was easier just to paint that than to put another name on it. So um, she opened her salon, and within the first year, she was a huge success. She uh, just had a knack for knowing uh, what women wanted and, and how to, um, again, marketing savvy. It's amazing to me, these women, because none of these women had more than a high school education. So the fact that they were just natural born marketers is just amazing to me. So she took out ads in you know, the high society magazines of the time, Town and Country, and uh, Vogue magazine, and she really wanted to sort of attract that old money, uh, aristocratic um, woman. She also uh, lined herself with the suffragettes because um, some of the suffragettes, like Alva Belmont, were these women that she she aspired to be like. So she, um, you know, she became suffragette, um, and that also helped sell her her products. Um, a couple of years after she started her business, she also went to Europe to learn uh, more techniques. I mean, both she and Helena Rubinstein uh, were constantly looking for ways to innovate their businesses. Um, they never rested on their laurels. They always were looking for new ways to um, expand their business. Um, she came up with the red door for her salon, which we now think of as her signature, the red door. But actually, her favorite color was pink. So a lot of her products that you see are all pink because that was her favorite color. One of her first products was the eight hour cream, which was uh, still one of her best sellers. She also uh, had a fragrance called Bluegrass after Kentucky, where she had her horse farm. So a list of innovations that she did in the beauty business are long. She was the first woman to introduce eye makeup to American women. 
when she was in Paris, she noticed that uh, Parisian women were all wearing eye makeup. So she bought eye makeup, took it back to the States, took it to a chemist, uh, found out what it was made of, and launched her own eye makeup. She was the first to pioneer the creation of a makeover, of having women come in and you know, do a complete makeover. There's the red door. And that's the inside of, of what a salon would look like. If you've ever seen the movie, The Women, the salon in The Women is based on Red Door Salon. Um, she opened salons in almost every city in the United States, New York, Washington, Boston, Chicago, and Beverly Hills. Um, she then launched in Melbourne, Hong Kong, London, Paris, Milan, and Rome. She personally went and opened every single salon um, near the first day. She greeted the customers personally. She um, trained a lot of the women who worked in the salons. Um, she cultivated this public persona of an upper-class wasp. Um, she once said that Sheik was Episcopalian. She uh, fended off complaints from the FDA. And by the time she died in 1966, she was still was the sole stockholder of her company. Both she and Helena Rubenstein managed to hold on to their companies to the very end, you know, fending off uh, takeover attempts. And um, she also developed the first travel size beauty products. So we have her to thank for every time we want to travel that we can take those little miniature bottles with us. In 1920, the image on the right um, was a French model named Cecile Bayless. That was one of her trademarks for the next 20 years, this sort of almost blank canvas of a woman. Uh, the picture on the far left is um, what was called Montezuma Red which was a color that matched the stripes and the scarf of women who were in the Marines. So she created the, the lipstick that all the women in the Marines wore during World War II. And she owned every single one of her international salons, except for one, which was the Parisian salon, which was owned by her sister Gladys. Um, Fortune Magazine said that she earned more money than any other businesswoman in the history of the United States, which is pretty, I think, amazing. She was also a firm believer in uh, exercise. Um, she helped popularize yoga in the United States, which we now think of yoga as just everyone does yoga. But she was one of the first women uh, back in the day to say yoga is amazing. And Gwyneth Paltrow did not. <laughs> she, Gwyneth Paltrow did not invent yoga or popularize it. It was Elizabeth Arden first. So when she, her company also still exists. It's now owned by Revlon, which I'm sure she, you know, up in heaven is probably furious at because you know both she and Helena Rubinstein referred to Charles Revson as that man. Um, both of them disliked him uh, because he was one of their chief rivals, or I think Helena Rubinstein called him the nail man. So I'm sure Elizabeth Arden, somewhere up in heaven, is not happy that Charles Brepson owns her business. And now we can come to our final woman, Estee Lauder, which is never underestimate any woman's desire for beauty. She was one of the first to begin gift with purchase. Uh, she developed a fragrance that would last 24 hours. And she created the first ever serum, Night Repair, which used uh, an apothecary style bottle to protect the formula's active ingredients. So Esty is, uh, was born and raised in Queens, Queens, New York, in Corona. Uh, Esté actually comes from her middle name. She was born Josephine. Esther, and her nickname was Esty, and so she changed it to Este with the accent to make it sound more 
uh, upper class, more French. She started out um, developing her interest in beauty as a young woman. Her uncle uh, was actually a chemist who created a lot of uh, facial creams that she started to sell for him. Uh, she, like these other, she would go door to door selling these, these facial creams and she helped him actually in his lab to create these facial creams. And um, she would go up to women like on the street or in uh, elevators and she would touch their face. And she would say, I could make you, I can make you look better. And she would like pull out a jar of cream and start putting, I mean, you can't do that now with the pandemic, but she would, you know, you tell them, you know, and, and do that and sell the cream. These are early look at uh, her early products. That color blue um, is something that she, she tested out a lot of colors and she decided that that color blue would look good in any bathroom. So that's why it's that color, it's the Estee Blue. Um, so she said of her Uncle John, do you know what it means for a young girl to suddenly have someone take their dreams quite seriously, teach her secrets? Um, she sold her uncle's products at charity luncheons. She would go to card parties, swimming clubs. She would go to, um, you know, the resorts in the Catskills, like Grossinger's and, and sell the products. Um, she managed to find, rent a small counter in a, a hair salon where she sold the products. And everyone, everyone who came into the hair salon would receive a free sample, whether they wanted one or not. Uh, so she had a ready-made clientele because these women who would come in to have their hair done would get a free sample of the face cream. Um, it wasn't until 1946 that Estee and her husband, Joseph, officially founded what we know as the Estee Water Company with four skincare products. And she and her husband were the entire company at first. They rented out a restaurant that wasn't used anymore and used the kitchen to manufacture the products. Um, a year later, they got their first major order, which was $800 worth of products from Saks Fifth Avenue, which sold out in two days. Um, at the time, most cosmetics were sold in grocery stores, drug stores, five and dime stores like Woolworths. From the very beginning, Estee wanted her products to be sold in department stores. And the reason for that is because if they were sold in department stores, um, you could have an impulse purchase because um, a lot of women had uh, charge cards, charge accounts with department stores. So if they went into a department store and they liked something, they could just put it on the charge account. Whereas if you go into a drugstore and you don't have the money, you're not gonna, you're not gonna buy it. So she, from the beginning, she focused solely on selling her stuff in department stores. Um, she started out, she gave away 80 lipsticks at a charity event at the prestigious Waldorf Astoria. And um, after the event, Saks was mobbed with women wanting to buy the lipstick. So um, that was another example for success. If you see on the left, that's Estee at a department store uh, giving a makeover. She personally opened every, every time her uh, products went into a department store, she opened the counter. She would go in, she would give makeovers, uh, see how much retail space she had in the store compared to her competitors. She would see how much Elizabeth Arden had, how much uh, Helena Rubinstein had, um, just to see you know, where she wanted to get to. And the middle one, that's from when uh, she was opening in uh, Newman Marcus. Again, uh, personally traveling. She traveled, I think, the first couple of years she was on the road 25 out of 52 weeks a year selling her products. And the final photo, that's Estee mixing her products 
to show you that, you know, how personally involved she was in them. Um, at one point in the company's history, only family members knew all the ingredients and all the formulas, all, all the products. That way she could be sure that no one could walk out the door knowing uh, the secrets. Here is just some early Estee Lauder ads. She, in 1962, she came up with the idea of, of having the Estee Lauder woman, which would be, they would uh, hire a, a model who would solely model for Estee Lauder. And during the first 20 years that they did this, they only had four women who were the Estee Lauder woman. Um, I think the woman on top, that's Willow Bay, who's probably one of the most famous women who was the Estee Lauder woman. You know, this way, this would sort of um, give, these women were sort of like the embodiment of who Estee Lauder thought of herself as. So they represented who Estee Lauder thought, she, felt that she was. And from the very beginning, um, it was a family business. Um, she, starting with her and her husband, her two sons, even as teenagers worked in the business. I think her older son would uh, deliver products on his bike <laughs> after school. He would deliver them to uh, various department stores. And that continues to this day. Uh, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren are still involved in the business. Um, they own, I think, the majority of the stock in the company. Um, and she also did something different. She slowly expanded the business. Instead of flooding the market with a lot of products, for the first like 15 years, it was just you know the skincare. And then she launched Youth Do, which was uh, she wanted to do a perfume, but um, perfumes were expensive, and um, it wasn't something that. It was something that you got as a gift or you saved up to buy. So she came up with the idea of instead of um, just having a perfume, it would be a body oil. You could put it in your bathtub, you could, um, and that lasted 24 hours. And Youth Do became one of their biz biggest sellers. In fact, when she was expanding into Europe um, and she wanted to sell her products at Gallery Lafayette, and um, they weren't interested in this American who wanted to sell their products. So she was in the store and she accidentally spilled youth do on the floor. And all these French women were like, what is this? You know, where can I buy this? And she was like, oh, well, you know, you can't buy it anywhere in, in France. And uh, that's how she got her product into Gallery Lafayette. But, you know, for the longest time, she still, you know, would go around and uh, touch women's faces and, you know, you help them with their, their, you know, finding the products that were right for them. And she trained all the salespeople herself. They had quotas, but she wanted to make sure that they didn't oversell. Like if someone had a quota and they went over the quota, she was worried because she didn't want them to like, make people feel that they had to buy something. She wanted it to be something organic. If they didn't buy it the first time, they would buy it maybe the next time. Um, she really wanted to make sure that people actually really wanted to buy her products. She also, um, when she was first starting out, she got the mailing list from Saks. And when they were sending out the uh, bills for the charge accounts, she got them to slip in samples into the envelopes which also got her products into people's hands. Um, she was also um, a one person research team. Um, she was very intimately involved in every aspect of her business. Um, up until her death, she was still intimately involved in the company. Um, the year before she died, the company had 21,500 employees and an estimated worth about $10 billion, which is amazing. 
um, to grow the company in that amount of time. Um, and that's where we are. As I said, the company is still in mainly in the hands of the Lauders. And you know, if you read you know the New York Times, the style section, you'll see um, the Lauders um, around. And her daughter-in-law is the one who created you know, Pink Ribbon, which is their hugely successful breast cancer campaign. Elizabeth, these women are extraordinary. These stories, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I heard the word unscrupulous used many times. <laughs> like <laughs> well, a few I mean, too many for comfort, actually, about some business partnerships and so on. Well, I mean, you know, nothing that these women did was anything that most men have done in business. It's just, you know, women are supposed to be, you know, feminine and, and, you know, not do these sort of things. But, you know, women can be probably, I think, even more ruthless than men in business. Would you say, uh, you know, some of these women have been depicted um, in various forms of entertainment. So we had the Madam C.J. Walker story on television called Self Made. We had... Right. Uh, the rivalry that you spoke of, Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein and War Paint. Um, have they been uh, accurately portrayed in media? Um, well, you know, it, a biopic is always going to be different. They're always going to stretch the truth. Um, as I, I think I mentioned before uh, with Self Made, they turned. Um, Annie Turnbow Malone into Annie Monroe um, as a way to, to talk about some issues in regards to colorism, um, but that's certainly not accurate. Um, but I would, I would say that in Self Made, um, a lot of it was pretty accurate. Um, you know, they did some fanciful things with it but it was certainly true to the spirit of who Madam C.J. Walker was. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the, there were moments where she had a lot of self doubt. I think maybe that they went a little bit overboard with that. I think um, Madam C.J. Walker, certainly when she started her company, she was much more uh, self-confident and that was really the difference between her and Annie Turnbo Malone was that, um, you know, Madam C.J. Walker wasn't afraid to sort of like get out there and tell her story and to use it to market. Whereas Annie was much more conservative, much more, uh, for her money was more of a way of giving back. And Madam C.J. Walker was more a way of showing that she had arrived. Um, and, and I think in War Paint, they were also pretty true to the story. You know, in real life, Elizabeth Arden and uh, Helena Rubinstein never met. Um, they would go, which is hilarious because they were invited to the same parties and the same events, but you know, they made sure that uh, they never spoke to each other. Um, or acknowledge the other one's existence if they were at an event. So that's very true to life. But, you know, of course, you only have two and a half hours in a musical and you have to shoehorn the songs in. But definitely uh, the way that they both reacted to Charles Revson was incredibly true to life. Um, in fact, War Paint is what got me interested in learning more about those two women because I just found them just to be so fascinating. Because they were so different, but yet so similar. I'm just amazing. Um, so uh, we have a few uh, time for a few questions from our wonderful audience. And one was, does the Poros building in St. Louis still, still stand? No. It both, does them, both the one in St. Louis and the one that she later bought in Chicago have both been torn down. 
it's one of, it's it's one of the reasons why um, she's less well known than Madame C.J. Walker because Madame C.J. Walker still has buildings with her name on them that still exist. Whereas I don't think Annie was as interested in preserving her legacy as Madame C.J. Walker was. Interesting. Uh, Pamela writes, uh, is there a museum for cosmetics? Oh, good question. I think there might be one in Paris, but I don't, there's definitely not one in the United States. Um, I, I do know that uh, at the African American Museum in Washington, D.C., they do have a Annie Turnbow Malone and Madame C.J. Walker section, but there's, I don't think there's any museum in the U.S. that's dedicated solely to um, going through the history. And it's too bad because I, I think there should be one and it should be one in New York. <laughs> there's, there's clearly so much phenomenal uh, history to all of it, uh, just yeah. evidenced by what we heard today. Um, so Elizabeth, my, my other question is, uh, you wrote this book in 2011, and here we are in 2020. Um, in that time, has anyone else come upon your radar that you would consider a cosmetic queen? Oh, um, Rihanna. Fenty. I mean, what she's managed to do in the short time that Fenty has been on the market is remarkable. And she is very much involved in the creation of the products. This is not, you know, a vanity project for her where she just puts her name on it and collects the money. She's very much involved in every aspect of it. Um, so she's definitely someone that um, I am in awe of. And um, it's, it's amazing what she's done. I think Fenty's only been in the market for three, four years, and she's managed to roll out a whole line of, of products that are just you know, fantastic. So Elizabeth, as someone who took a, a hobby and an interest and a passion and turned it into something really extraordinary with your book, Scandalous Women, what advice would you give to someone who has a passion and a, a love of something? I would say that um, if it's something that you love, don't think of it as, this is something I have to make money at. Just think of it as something that you're passionate about because that's gonna carry you through whatever you decide to do with it. Whether it's you know a passion for acting or a passion for writing or a passion for fashion, you have to remember what it is that started you off in terms of the passion, because there are going to be times, and I can tell you this from as, as a writer, where you get to a point where you just can't stand <laughs> it anymore. And you have to remind yourself why you wanted to do this in the first place. What was it about these women or whatever, um, that got you started because there are going to be times when you're just going to like want to throw it in the trash and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but you have to just remember what it is that got you, got the juices flowing. It made you want to do this, this passion. That's well, wonderful advice. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today in your wonderful presentation. Sure. And we so look forward to August 2021, <laughs> when we can read Pretty Evil New York. Yeah, um, I'm sounds thick in the weeds on that right now. <laughs> You're what, sorry? I'm thick in the weeds on that right now. I've, I've got piles and piles of, of books and newspaper clippings of, about the women that I'm gonna be writing about. But I'm, I'm very excited. There's some interesting women in this book that not many people know about, so I'm happy.
Fantastic. We can't wait. Elizabeth, Carrie Mahone, thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to remind our audience that if you're interested in other programs produced by the National Arts Club, you can visit our YouTube channel. You can also go to nationalartsclub.org um, to find out about upcoming events. I'm David Zyla, and thank you for joining us.